and while they last. Joining me now, Joe Serencioni, president of the Plowshares Fund. Anusha Hossein, writer and commentator. Uh, Anusha Hossein, writer and commentator. Christine Ahn, founder of the group Women Cross DMZ. And Malcolm Nance, MSNBC contributor. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Christine, I'm going to go to you first. And just, um, just a note to um, the audience, there's a slight delay. Uh, Christine, you just returned from the DMZ. Uh, and I want to get your take on how this thing fell apart and whether or not President Moon Jae-in of, so of, uh, of South Korea is succeeding in trying to put it back together. Well, in the last week, we saw some pretty barbed exchanges between North Korea, um, you know, sending messages to the Trump administration. I mean, clearly targeted at John Bolton. Um, there were two things that took place preceding those um, pretty sh like harsh rhetoric. And one was um, the introduction of B-52 bombers and F-22 Raptor fighter jets during the U.S. ROK war drills. And then clearly the uh, Libyan model that John Bolton and then Mike Pompeo Heo later were uh, basically stating that that was the model for North Korea. And clearly that is not preparing the table for peace talks that very much angered North Korea, would anger anybody who is uh, beginning a diplomatic process. And so North Korea sent a clear message and the Trump administration uh, used that opportunity to basically unilater unilaterally withdraw from the June 12th summit. But as you noted, there is so much that is taking place in the last 24 hours. Um, we organized a delegation of 30 women to be here to support the peace process. And uh, today we marched uh, on the DMZ, 1,200 South Korean women marched with 30 women from 16 countries calling for a peace treaty to end the war. And it was unbelievable that just yesterday, uh, President Trump said that he would not meet Kim in Singapore. And so we, uh, we protested outside of the U.S. Embassy. And, you know, it's so great to know that while we were at the DMZ today, that the leaders of North and South Korea just proceeded. They were undeterred by Trump's whiplash diplomacy. And the, the peace train has left the station. And it's so heartening to see that the two huh. Korean leaders are proceeding to try to end the war. And, and you know, Joe Serencioni, there, you know, on the one hand, you know, we, we had some fun with their this, this coin that Donald Trump created. Um, but on the one hand, you have the Trump administration wanting full credit for any progress toward peace on the Korean Peninsula, full credit. But on the other hand, it is the Trump administration that seems to be the biggest impediment to getting any sort of a peace deal, even a summit. They are the ones who seem to be in the way. Three items, the Washington Post, uh, to Christine's point, uh, about John Bolton, who has always had this extremely hawkish attitude toward really pretty much the entire planet, uh, but, but, but particularly toward North Korea. Bolton, John Bolton, who's the new national security advisor, advised, per the Washington Post, that the threatening language um, was a very bad sign, that the president told advisors he was concerned Kim was maneuvering to back out of the summit and make Americans look like desperate suitors. And this was because of North Korea, North Koreans calling Mike Pence, the American vice president, a political dummy. And here is why they did that. This is um, five for my producers. Here is Mike Pence on Fox News on Monday threatening regime change if there's no deal. This will only end like the Libyan model ended if Kim Jong-un doesn't make a deal. The Libya model, Muammar Gaddafi, who was dragged through the streets and, and deposed. Um, and then we have one more piece, the NBC News report, that there's actually a divide inside the administration between Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, and John Bolton. Several administration officials say Pompeo, who has taken the lead in negotiating with the North Koreans, blamed Bolton for torpedoing the progress that had already been made. Try to make sense of this for, for us, Joe Serencioni, because you have people in the administration who do not seem to want a deal. They want regime change. You lay that out beautifully, Joy, so let's try to unpack a little bit about it. First, John Bolton was dead wrong in the advice he gave the president. He said that North Korea was, was, was threatening to pull out. That is not true. And you just saw the, the interest that the North has in continuing this summit process demonstrated dramatically on the Korean Peninsula today with his meeting with President Moon. President Moon and, and Chairman Kim, not Supreme Leader, 
uh, are the ones who have been driving this process ever since the Olympics to try to get the, this summit to, to happen. I think they are still both committed to it. So Bolton advises the president incorrectly, gives him bad advice. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis uh, are apparently not consulted in this. and. And Trump issues this impulsive letter, an embarrassing letter, as you heard Mike Pompeo uh, read it. Okay, then he realizes that this has completely unnerved the U.S. allies in in Asia. This roller coaster diplomacy has has raised serious questions about the reliability of America and the credibility of our word. He then Trump appears to be backtracking. And go and now put putting the summit process back on. This is a good move. If I were betting, I would bet we're going to have this summit. Why? Because of what Christine just said. The peace train has left the the station. There is a tremendous interest in both Koreas and among particularly among the South Koreans to to have a meeting to see if there's a path forward. It appears that North Korea has been consistent about its desire to discuss a step by step denuclearization of the peninsula. It's been the Americans that have been vacillating on this. And you see that this process is, and the American side is driven largely by Donald Trump's insecurities and his vain, glorious attitude, the way he smiled when the crowd chants Nobel. He, he, he's now putting the summit back on. Why? Because uh, Kim Jong un wrote him a flattering letter. I think that Trump. Moon and Kim are now reinvested in having this summit go forward. I'd, I'd predict we're going to see a summit sooner or later. Yeah, and you know, it, it is interesting to contrast sort of the personality types such as we know it, uh, Malcolm, of Kim Jong un and Donald Trump. Uh, you know, Tony Schwartz actually wrote The Art of the Deal, who knows Trump pretty well and has some pretty uh, dark thoughts about him, said that Trump. Um, has a morbid fear of being humiliated and shamed. This is showing the, uh, this is showing who's the biggest and the strongest. So he is exquisitely sensitive to the possibility that he would end up looking weak and small. There's nothing more unacceptable to Trump than that. So you have this, the, you know, you have an American president who some, his, his administration is standing in the way of peace, and then his own personality seems to be standing in the way, even when the president of South Korea is willing to give him the credit, if that's what it takes, to get peace. Well, his personality is driving this entire process. And to tell you the truth, I don't think he will, in the end, get the credit that he's looking for. He's looking for a Nobel Prize. Let's, let's just put that on the table. Ever since 1987, when he took out that, front, that New York Times full-page article asking the uh, then Bush administration to make him a nuclear negotiator for the START talks, Donald Trump has been looking for global acclaim. But what we have here is we have a North Korea that understands this man's ego must be massaged and can be manipulated. And they are manipulating him. There are other regional uh, aspects of these negotiations that are not being satisfied. Japan wants the return of people who have been kidnapped by North Korea. South Korea wants to reopen the relationships between families in North and South Korea and the industrial center that they have, and to which will, if all of these things happen, create an opening for North Korea to get more trade, more money, uh, more resources without the United States. This is a good example of why Kim Jong-un's plan to actually retain those nuclear weapons has propelled him back into the normal routine of states. He's never giving up the bombs, so he's going to get something out of this, and Trump is going to give it to him. Well, and, and that is, I think, a really good point, Anusha, because, you know, Donald Trump has given him the sort of legitimacy on the world stage that he craves. He's treated him as an equal, which is something Kim Jong-un has wanted. And it feels like the two Koreas are driving everything, and Trump is just, you know, to be blunt, they're blundering, and he's just revealing sort of his own insecurities daily. In this letter, canceling the summit, Trump is said to have dictated this letter that includes the line, you talk about your nuclear capabilities, but ours are so massive and powerful that I pray to God they will never have to be used. Then you have the Atlantic quoting officials on North Koreans literally just not picking up the phone. That when the Americans are trying to call, they're just not picking up the phone. But who are they are picking up the phone? Probably to China. NBC News reporting that China, Beijing, is the hidden hand behind the summit's derailment as President Xi Jinping became increasingly anxious about the potential reunification of the Korean Peninsula with China on the sidelines. And here is Donald Trump claiming that the, the, the change happened because China changed its 
uh, because uh, China changed its attitude or Kim Jong Un changed its attitude. It's all sort of personality driven. But Donald Trump doesn't seem to be driving any of the actual developments. Exactly, Joy. And you know, it is personality driven. But if we go back to that letter for a second, not only was it a bad breakup letter, but that letter had serious personality <laughs> disorders. I mean, it's like your sixth grade boyfriend saying it's over. You know, my stick is bigger than yours. But, you know, if you want to maybe call me, maybe <laughs> I know this is crazy, but <laughs> here's my number. Call me, maybe. But on a much more serious note, I mean, it's unbelievable that the president of the United States wrote that letter. That letter was nuts. Mm. But things have changed in the past 24 hours. And what's crazy now is that Kim Jong-un is looking like the stable, mature leader. And he has completely taken over these talks and made the U.S. irrelevant. It's supposed to be the, U the U.S. and South Korea, our ally, getting to the table and talking to North Korea. But now, not only is the U.S. completely kind of left out of the process, but Donald Trump, the master negotiator, is at home tweeting. And, you know, Christine, we've already pulled out uh, of TPP, so Pacific trade is now in the hands of China. China seems to be the, the big player other than South Korea in trying to, you know, in sort of deciding kind of what the future economically is in the region. How important at this point is China relative to, to South Korea in making sure that a summit actually happens? I think everybody in the region is pretty supportive of the Korea peace process. I think the only one that's really driving a wedge between uh, the U.S. and our and 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 are okay is the U.S. Um, clearly, when uh, the Trump administration threatened to totally destroy North Korea, there would be obviously devastating consequences for the entire Korean Peninsula. And so, I think it's really important to remember when we were walking today in the DMZ. I was walking with women whose siblings are still in North Korea. And when we were uh, overlooking the Imjin River across into North Korea through those telescopes, I heard a, a father tell his young son, those are, uh, we are the same people, but we can't see each other. So I think that we have to bring it back to, uh, this is about the Korean people. This is a, a, a conflict that has lasted for seven decades. This is a strip of land that is the most symbolic, uh, you know, manifestation of a long-term division. Let the Korean people see peace on the Korean Peninsula. That's what they want. And, uh, and the international community should support it. And so this is not about who is gaming who. This is about the will of the Korean people. Millions of families remain separated. They don't want to live in a perpetual state of war. The international community should support it. Moon and Kim should get the Nobel Peace Prize. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't allow peace and the Korean people to be held hostage by Trump or the U.S. at this moment. Well said. Brava. And I think uh, I think the world um, should listen to what you just said, Christine. Uh, the point is that the people of the Korean Peninsula deserve to have peace. Maybe the Trump administration should just get out of the way. Joe Srincioni, Anusha Hossein, Christine Ahn, Malcolm Nance, thank you all very much. And up next, the latest on Trump's attacks on the Department of Justice.